for it afterwards. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really appreciative today to um, Dr. Amelie Gaudin, um, Assessor, Associate Professor of Agroecology in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of California, Davis, and Kelsey Brewer, who is a PhD candidate and part of the research team there. They're developing and testing sustainable management practices that have biodiversity and soil health as a basis for improvements. In particular, they've been exploring how diversification, diversification strategies, such as livestock reintegration into cropping systems, affects crop and soil mechanisms involved in building system sustainability and resilience. So I'm going to hand on over to Emily at this point and I'll stop my screen share. Emily, welcome. We really appreciate having you here. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all today. Um, I will start sharing my screen. What I also wanted to do is show you a little video um, as we're gonna move along. So um, be ready for that in a few minutes. I hope everyone can see this okay. So um, thanks for the kind invitation to participate to this webinar series. Um, Kelsey and I would like to share with you some results from um, research and science-based information about sheep grazing in vineyards. We hope to discuss the components of this agroecological practice, um, some of the management considerations um, and potential benefits to soil health, but also consider some trade-offs um, based on research and grower surveys we've been conducted over the last four years. Um, this is a collaboration with um, uh, CAF, uh, Chaos Sheep Outfit, um, the Napa RCD, and with financial support uh, from Fibershed and CDFA. Again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and then um, uh, we can address them at the end of this, this talk. Kelsey and I will be co-presenting. So Kelsey is a PhD candidate in, in my research group, um, and he's been leading most of the research on, on those systems thus far. So California has a very diverse landscape um, and also type of agricultural operations and, and commodities. And it goes from very extensive systems such as rangeland to more intensively managed system um, growing a, a wide range of, of specialty crops, for instance. And uh, we find a similar range with, uh, of operation with animal production from grazing on rangeland to, to feedlots. And historically, agricultural system produced a diverse set of commodities that included both plants and animal products and kind of exploited the tight linkages between animal and crop to, to maintain productivity. Uh, where output or waste material from uh, one enterprise would often serve as an input for another enterprise, such as crop residue to feed livestock and livestock manure to fertilize crops, for instance. Um, however, uh, various rounds of um, intensification as well as market pressure have led to a high degree of specialized operation and decoupling of crop and livestock system um, with very compartmentalized feed and forage production, um, specialty crops um, and animal production. So what we've been interested in is exploring um, ways we can reintegrate livestock into cropping system and measuring its impact on um, and potential to improve soil health and system productivity. In fact, integrated crop livestock system are a backbone of agriculture, um, especially in, in developing economies, and it remains a, a very important system, so we call them mixed systems, um, in global agriculture. But it's not widespread in California, despite, um, despite uh, opportunities that come from our very diverse landscape and operation. And what's interesting about reintegrating livestock into cropping system is creating this circular or semi-circular flow of nutrients and energy um, to better use services provided by animal for production. 
I put here um, a few example of a predominant integrated crop livestock system. And we can think about uh, grazing on crop residue as being a form of integration. Uh, grazing dual purpose forage crop, grazing of cover crops within cash crop rotation, having a pasture rotation, uh, which is also called phase farming. And what we're interested in today is really thinking about grazing of understory vegetation in perennials and in our case, uh, vineyards. And uh, uh, livestock integration has been shown in the literature, in the scientific literature, um, to provide key production, to have the potential to provide key production services um, in terms of labor reduction, uh, nutrient provision, um, helping build soil health, managing weeds, etc. Um, so <clears throat> what I wanted to do is um, uh, show you a, a short video that we, we um, in collaboration with Soy Centric and, and Fibershed produced um, last year that kind of goes over um, some of our research and, and framing around those questions. I hope it will all work for you sound wise. We all learned in the past 15, 20 years that uh, nature already knew how to do it. And every time we've gotten involved, we've messed it up. So moving back to patterns and systems and orders of nature is incredibly sustainable and it's incredibly efficient. The way we're producing food and meat in particular today is unsustainable and is leading to a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. By using livestock and bringing back different grasses and different species, it's gonna change the way we farm. An integrated crop livestock system is an agricultural system that actively integrated livestock component and a crop production component. I think when we have this conveyor belt system of this like production, we, we tend to focus on a few traits of trees or animals and therefore forget that there's like a complexity and like the beauty of a diversity that actually creates the resiliency in a system. Biodiversity is our secret weapon. We can't do it without it. It's using biodiversity to provide services that are now being provided by external inputs. Offsetting those inputs using living organisms. My name is Jamie Irwin and my husband Robert Irwin and I run Chaos Sheep Outfit. I am a first generation rancher. My husband is a third generation rancher. The reason we're a good mix is I kind of bring fresh eyes on the scene and he has a generational knowledge um, that is really, really important for successful livestock operation. <laughs> So sheep are going to be mowing through these vineyards, uh, grazing grass. Once it's harvested, they're going to clean up all the extra fruit so that the diseases won't be there to go into the host into the following year. And then they're going to clean up all the summer uh, broadleaves and annuals that have sprouted uh, in the vineyard throughout the summer. In the, in the winter time, they're going to take the nutrient cycle and they're going to move the nutrients throughout the entire vineyard. So they're going to spread all the grass that was here through their stomach spread it out through the entire vineyard. The benefit that we provide for landowners and land managers is bringing down their costs for mowing and, and managing their land as well. Sheep are able to put on up to a half a pound, sometimes more than half a pound a day while eating grass. And then the manure that they drop out the back still has 90% of the nutrients that they took up from the start. Grasses are meant to, to be chewed on by a ruminant animal. You end up getting more seed production with a ruminant animal grazing. Biodynamic orchards and vineyards need to have the animal component because they take away from the pesticides and the, and the mowing that they would otherwise have to use. We're affecting thousands of acres very quickly. One landowner can have 2,000 acres, which is a small ranch in California, 
And by changing just a little bit of the way he thinks about how he manages that property, it affects drastically 2,000 acres. So that's carbon sequestration on 2,000 acres like that. Well, this is a win-win for uh, both the producer uh, uh, of the crop and the producer of the sheep. I think the biggest winner of everybody is the, is the land and the animals. For us here in California, especially in the Central Coast, water is probably the biggest issue for us. Um, bringing livestock into an agricultural situation holds more water. We're increasing the manure, the organic matter in the soil. That's carbon, that's holding water capacity. This summer, we had the biggest fire that ever happened in California. Having the animals graze here has made our farm much more resilient to fire. You could see a real big difference between our place and our neighbor who doesn't graze any animals in just the color of the ground. If you've got stuff where you've got a tree that's hanging down and you have tall grass underneath it, the grass acts as a ladder and then it just goes right up the tree and then you lose the tree too. So. When the animals come through, they lift the understory of any low-hanging branches and really reduce the speed in which if a fire did come through, uh, you, you wouldn't have that high ladder burning because that understory has been, been grazed. My name is Jean Neer. I was born December 31st, 1914. That makes me 103, and apparently I'm going to get to be 104. I've been raising sheep for uh, 53 years. The reason I got sheep in the first place was for fire control, and that was the beginning of sheep in my life. And in the next 20 years, we need to have more people that are able to manage marginal landscapes. It's going to be really, really important to get more people in the livestock production side because as, as we are teetering right now on a knowledge infrastructure cracking point where we're not going to have a, the infrastructure or the knowledge base to train the next generation of people that are going to be interested in, in chasing ruminants around. Grazing School of the West is a vocational training program for next generation of land stewards working with livestock. The vision has been to invite new relationships in inner cities to, to build a bridge to link opportunities for folks who are looking for work with the work and opportunity of being urban grazers. At the end of our run, the, our biggest achievement won't be how many acres we grazed, but how many people we got it, uh, excited about doing what we're doing. Growers are listening. The consumers want a different system. Everything is poised to, to be able to do it. Building something with the kids is why I do it, and, and so, doing something that makes sense. Feeling like we're making a difference um, in the animals and in the land. We're creating a critical mass here that can really be used to change the paradigm. I think life's about relationships, and, and the relationship not with just people, but with the land, the animals. And so if you build relationships and everybody works together, the only thing that can happen is positive. Thanks for watching this, this little videos with us that um, kind of show a little bit of, of, of our work and the relationship with cre we've created with growers and, and shepherd into thinking about sheep integration into, into vineyard system and, 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 and supporting our quantification of potential benefits. So we've also spent some time talking with growers, um, 14 of them. Um, to see who are integrating livestock um, in their vineyards and thinking about, well, how do they make it work? What are the set of practices that are instrumental for their success? 
Well, most of them, are, I would say a large majority of them, um, graze mostly during winter dormancy of the vine. So potential competition and chewing on, on, on the fruit is, is not an issue. Uh, most of the industry relies on contractors for grazing. Um, and you've, you've seen the example of Keo Sheep Outfit with, with Jamie and Robert, who are wonderful uh, partners uh, to um, vineyard managers in, in grazing. Um, they usually do one to two grazing events um, during the winter uh, by moving fences and having small blocks and parcels uh, created and moving sheep around every two to three days. Uh, the recommendation is uh, high density, low duration grazing of 10 to 30 sheep per acre for no more than two or three days. Um, and that's um, to limit soil compaction. Uh, it's very important to work with grazers who have an intimate knowledge of the soils and their systems so that um, some potential um, uh, trade-offs uh, can be avoided. It's also important to think about uh, forage values of the cover crops or the native vegetation to the, to the sheep. And there's some opportunities here to co-design specific cover crop mixes that include legumes, cereals, and brassicas for adequate uh, feed. Some growers use sheep for leaf and sucker removal during the growing season. It tends to be more expensive and it has, a, it has to be very precisely managed. So need some excellent knowledge of sheep behavior to be able to do that. But it's a possibility and it's been successful in some operations. Um, some growers also have year-long integration, and this is not something we see in California, but rather elsewhere in Europe and in New Zealand, um, where there's a breed of sheep, the baby doll sheep, that are less common um, because they are more expensive than regular breed and, and worth less on the meat market, but they allow grazing for um, all, all year long because they have a smaller stature. There's also opportunities for higher trellis system for vineyards. So something to be thinking of when designing vineyard if sheep grazing is um, one of the objectives, um, there are some opportunities here to adapt the design. Uh, I spent some time in, in New Zealand a few, um, a few years ago, um, where basically 100% of farmers and vineyard integrate sheep uh, during winter dormancy. 13% of them actually utilize sheep for leaf plucking, so removal of leaves during the season. And 7% of them um, um, graze for a longer period of time. And, and I think there's a lot to be learned from how growers are doing it there. Um, they've developed some ways um, of growing the vine with higher trellis, lower irrigation lines, um, and semi-permanent semi to permanent fencing structures um, that allows for easier grazing of, of sheep into vineyards. So um, what are the, some of the potential benefits that we see? Well, when you start integrating sheep into a, a vineyard, you can expect some impact on um, pests uh, with some potential pest suppression. And here we can think about weed control, but also other uh, fungal diseases or um, insect pests. It helps uh, with controlling the cover crop and terminating the cover crop. Um, and recycling residues a little bit more precisely um, and shifting the timing of um, nutrient flow and cycling in the system. It also had another level of biodiversity in our landscape with potential to limit nutrient losses. What um, uh, we've measured is that in terms of labor and herbicide needs, uh, you, um, you can count, and this is based on research out of New Zealand because they've had a long history of integration, uh, two to three fewer mows annually um, and one to 1.3 fewer herbicide application, which uh, combined together largely um, uh, offset the cost of, of grazing in, in the landscape. Uh, we've also anecdotally heard from growers, and you'll see some example in the video I show you about the potential for fire prevention, which is obviously a prime concern for California growers. There's also a marketing aspect that um, uh, wineries that do uh, integrate sheep are using, um, and that is especially relevant for larger wineries where they're able to um, uh, use uh, sheep in a way to uh, market their wine a little bit differently and attract some more 
more um, business and, and, and communicate about their practices in a different way. Um, it provides additional grass for grazing, but also some climate change mitigation potential. And um, this is mostly through soil health benefit. And I'm gonna let Kelsey, my, my PhD student, who's been uh, looking very precisely at the potential and impacts of sheep grazing and vineyard to build soil health, um, to tell you a little bit more um, about um, uh, the potential benefits. Thank you, Alwyn. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and start uh, by framing soil health. Um, as uh, Jamie Irwin was kind of discussing in the video, uh, the perception of a lot of contract sheep uh, grazers that do this work in vineyards is that one of the main benefits of this integration is improvements in soil health. And when we're talking about soil health, it's kind of a, a term that's, that's come out um, over the last five years really strong. And it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, the way we kind of frame it is looking at uh, first and foremost, supporting the production of food and fiber. Um, and the production of food and fiber is a type of what we refer to as ecosystem service. Um, you know, it benefits humanity uh, uh, in, in a similar kind of way to other services. And so uh, a healthy soil, we can look at this figure over here on the right and we can see that it's building and storing soil carbon. It's uh, regulating nutrient cycling. So it's converting, it's, it's um, uh, decomposing residues and releasing the nutrients stored in those residues at rates that are optimal for uh, the subsequent uh, uh, growth of crops. It helps to store and conserve water um, and then it's also related to soil structure and the microbial community that exists within the soil ecosystem. So it's also important for us to realize that when we're talking about soil health, um, it's measuring dynamic properties. And so these properties that we, we measure, such as nutrients and microbes and structure, they change over time based on our management practices and our co-management practices that we have along with uh, livestock integration. So they'll, they'll be dynamic on a single landscape and they're also kind of tied to the inherent properties of the soil in which the vineyard is housed in. So um, on our landscape, we have a series of practices that we can implement and these practices such as tillage or mowing or herbicide application or livestock grazing um, kind of fall into different principles of management. And so uh, the NRCS uh, has for a long time now had four major principles of soil health. And those principles are to keep soil covered as much as possible uh, with residues or living plants, helping to reduce erosion and exposure of the soil to the sun, using diversity um, in our planned diversity in our cropland uh, to improve the diversity of the soil ecosystem. Uh, keeping living roots in soil as long as possible. And this is actually a very critical one uh, when thinking about our management because a lot of uh, recent research in soil health and soil carbon sequestration has showed that uh, plant roots contribute substantially more to soil health than above ground residues do. Um, so keeping those living roots is really important and also trying to reduce the disturbance in our landscapes as well. So agriculture is kind of um, uh, intimate in, an intimate component of agriculture is disturbance. And, but we, we try and think about where we might apply those disturbances strategically and limit them. Um, and more recently, the NRCS has decided to put livestock integration as the fifth principle of soil health, um, fitting really nicely into the integrated crop livestock systems. Yet um, we still are, are lacking a lot of uh, research into the outcomes of livestock integration and cropland. So that's some of the work that we've been doing in, in the Boudon lab. So when we're looking at soil health, uh, the main thing that we tend to focus in on is soil carbon and soil carbon being a building block in the soil of soil health. Another way of thinking about it is that it's like a central variable that all other soil health um, variables interact with and improve with improvements in carbon. So this figure over here on the right, we have total organic carbon in the center, and we see that uh, organic carbon affects chemical, biological, and physical components of the soil ecosystem. From a chemical point of view, it can help to um, immobilize pollutants or heavy metals, especially in urban agriculture, but it also helps to kind of store and release nutrients um, 
for uh, critical crop growth periods. There's also a very important biological function that carbon is playing in the soil in that carbon is a energy source for the soil microbiological community, the, the fungi and the bacteria to use this carbon as an energy source to drive processes. Some of these processes can be nutrient mineralization and the release of nutrients into bioavailable forms for plant uptake, but also critical um, functions that help to improve the resiliency of our soils to um, potential abiotic stresses like drought or uh, flood. And then lastly, uh, it, there's a very physical component of carbon and that carbon kind of acts like a sponge in the soil or like a glue-like substance helping to bind uh, sand, silt, and clay particles into aggregates, which improves the porosity of our soil and the ability of air and water to infiltrate throughout the soil profile in, in, in what is ultimately an ecosystem. So when looking at how we put carbon into our soils, that's driven by photosynthesis. Solar energy from the sun and CO2 in the atmosphere are used in photosynthesis to create um, sugars. And those sugars are used to create the biomolecules of the plant. And when the plant dies and deposits its residues and in roots into the soil, this microbiological community uses these residues as an energy source to drive functions and store carbon. So then moving along more to how sheep integration might impact various pathways in which carbon can be stored in the soil. There are some direct pathways um, in which uh, grazing affects net primary productivity or just the landscape productivity and photosynth uh, photosynthesis of our landscape and therefore the amount of carbon that's coming into the, the ecosystem. Uh, critically, it's also transforming residues and converting them into dung and urine. And the forms of carbon in this dung and urine are much more, uh, are easier for microbes to access and break down. And this dung and uh, urine also has nutrients that are in more readily bioavailable forms. So they can be taken up more quickly by uh, actively growing plants. Uh, another direct impact of grazing on the understory forage and vineyard systems is uh, the effect that it has on the, the roots. So things like root architecture might shift or the depth in which roots um, are going into the soil and also the, the exudates or the compounds that the roots are secreting out, it might change both the quantity and the quality of those exudates as well. And then there are some indirect pathways, both within a season and across season, there's a plant community response to the grazing pressure itself. So grazing is a selection pressure, an ecological selection pressure, and the community composition of the understory vegetation will change as a response to the intensity, the duration, and the timing or the periodicity in which we graze. And lastly, the effect of grazing on soil structure. Um, so, Grazing is returning lots of carbon that, as we, I just mentioned, can help improve soil structure, but there's also the direct impact of trampling and the hoof action of the sheep that might uh, be associated with compaction trade-off in the long run. So what we have done is um, we conducted a survey of paired, grazed, and ungrazed vineyard sites uh, across the uh, Sonoma, Napa, and Lake County. Um, one, so uh, one of the sites at each paired site had been has been uh, integrated with sheep grazing for 10 or more years, and the other site uh, has used mowing and herbicide application as the understory management strategy. Other than that, um, these sites that are paired together have similar vine histories, similar yields, same soil types, um, same rootstock and clone varieties, and the management style, co-management style is similar on both sites as well. Um, so when we looked at grazing versus uh, the under, uh, mowing on, for understory vegetation management, one of the first things that we saw is that this red line represents the soil organic carbon kind of uh, baseline for mowing. And anything above that is an increase in carbon as a result of grazing and anything below it would be a decrease. So we see that in the top uh, zero to 15 centimeters of the soil, an average across all three of these paired sites we saw almost a 1% increase in soil organic carbon content. And that increase in soil organic carbon content um, decreased a little bit in its quantity, but was a trend that we found all the way down to 45 centimeter depth zone. And kind of focusing back in specifically on soil microbes, um, 
and uh, soil microbes using this carbon to drive functions. And some of the key functions that are very relevant for producers and society in general are the decomposition of residues. So they're ensuring that the understory vegetation residues are actually being um, removed and decomposed and contributing back to active carbon and nutrient pools quicker. Um, and also uh, these microbes are key for soil aggregation and structure and symbiotic relationships with plants that improve the health and productivity of crops and help to control soil-borne pathogens. And what we saw is um, we have site one, site two, and site three of our three paired site study. We saw that in integrated um, vineyards, the gray bars, that uh, microbial biomass was higher at the zero to 15 centimeter depth zone in all three of our sites. So it was a very strong trend that when sheep are integrated into a vineyard, the microbial biomass increases as a result and therefore the ability to drive some key functions. Um, and so kind of integrating this back into the soil health framework of Krista Marshall, another PhD uh, student in Amelie's lab, we see that as healthy, soil, healthy soils should be building and storing carbon, well, we saw 1.25 times more soil organic carbon in the integrated vineyard. Um, really quick, this column over here on the right for, for kind of metric nerds in the virtual room kind of shows the grazed um, and ungrazed raw numbers of various metrics that we, we analyzed. But kind of going back to the left column, um, regulating nutrient cycling. Well, we saw 1.3 times more total soil nitrogen in the integrated sites and also two times more bioavailable nitrogen that can be taken up actively by plants. We also saw that uh, soil nitrogen cycling enzymes were 1.5 uh, times more active. So that microbial biomass is starting to contribute to a more active cycling of soil nitrogen. We also measured some soil structure indicators and we saw no increased compaction um, as a trend across all three of our sites. And actually we saw a slight increase in aggregate stability, which again might be related to the fact that this microbial biomass in these integrated systems is higher. And then lastly, we kind of did a few measurements directly of the soil microbiological community. And we saw that the pool of active carbon, um, the carbon that's being cycled actively by microbes was 1.4 times higher in the integrated systems. And, and again, that microbial biomass was 1.4 times higher as well. We also saw a, a slight increase in, in microbial biodiversity in the integrated sites as well. So kind of um, wrapping up the soil health results uh, into a more concise uh, manner, we saw increases in carbon, microbial biomass, stable organic nitrogen that's being stored long term, also bioavailable nitrogen and bioavailable phosphorus. And then of course we saw that that residue turnover rate of the integrated sites is significantly higher in the integrated systems than the non-integrated systems. And that this translated to some benefits for the, the soil ecosystem and that the, microbi uh, the microbiological community was both a little bit more diverse and also trended toward more fungal dominated communities, which is usually another indicator of soil health. And that we saw higher populations of very specific um, functional groups of microbes such as mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae which is a symbiotic um, fungi that makes associations with crops and helps to improve water and nutrient uptake. We also saw that saprophytic fungi and actinomycetes were higher, which are critical in residue decomposition. We also saw that there might be some potential trade-offs. Um, so the, the conversion of residues into dung and urine uh, does concentrate salts. And so there could be a potential uh, salinity increase in the top horizon of soils, um, though we didn't measure any of this in our, uh, we didn't measure any uh, significant salinity increases in our survey. And that compaction still kind of remains inconclusive, but there could be trade-offs com of compaction by integrating uh, livestock into a vineyard, depending on the time in which you graze, especially if you're grazing during uh, wet and frozen periods. And um, <clears throat> while it could be a benefit to have a higher bioavailable or leachable nitrogen fact fraction, <clears throat> um, we could also see potential nitrogen losses if there isn't productivity to be utilizing those, those bioavailable nutrients. And then um, there are lots of things that we didn't measure in this survey. And so um, soil hyd hydrological um, conditions and the water movement and storage were not measured. And we really wanna delve a lot more into the adaptation and mitigation potential of livestock integration to help combat climate change and increase the resilience of vineyards to the potential impacts of climate change like drought. 
So uh, we are now entering uh, our third year of a uh, short-term monitoring trial in which we've been monitoring uh, the Huachica Creek demonstration vineyard, which is the demonstration vineyard for the Napa uh, Regional Conservation District. And we've been, um, yeah, so we are in our third year now, uh, kind of looking at a, a whole wide array of various measurements, both uh, the forage uh, understory vegetation dynamics, the biomass accumulation, the biodiversity and the root growth. Also measurements of vine productivity and success. Um, so yield, uh, leaf nitrogen content, um, stem water potential, and then really delving deeper into this soil health question um, over, over several years. And we have a, a treatment gradient that we hope to be able to parse out some co-management effects with as well. So every other row of this vineyard has experienced uh, no-till management since 1991, and every other row is tilled. So there's a tillage gradient, and there's also um, planted cover crops in the tilled rows and a resident vegetation treatment in the no-till rows. So we have four total treatments, um, and they kind of interact in a disturbance gradient. And so part of the way that we're looking at sheep integration in the vineyards is a different type of disturbance that can maybe displace other forms of disturbance like tillage or herbicides or mowing, or also be combined, combined with some of those strategies. And so we're, yeah, looking um, kind of at a, a, a hopefully more robust suite of data and information that will be out uh, over the next couple of years. So, um, of course, there's uh, Kelsey mentioned some potential trade-offs, and in terms of soil health, we are talking to growers. We've also identified some perceived barriers to adoption um, that will guide um, research um, over the next few years. The first one that comes around a lot is the risk of soil compaction, as mentioned. So um, there's some more work to be done in terms of um, managing grazing uh, to lower those risk of, of soil compaction, even though we, we've seen in our studies, in our survey study that um, uh, increases in soil compaction are not widespread at all with, with sheep integration. That's it's a lot of question remained about how to best manage sheep to avoid this. Uh, a second concern is damaging uh, of, of irrigation lines, and, and that might be improved by um, uh, redesigning the systems. Um, in general, those damages are um, pretty um, minimal. So it happens uh, as sheep move from row to row, but it's not necessarily something very widespread across the vineyard. Of course, that will depend about your irrigation structure. So there's still some, some questions about optimal management of the animal to maximize benefits, especially when it comes down to fertility and pest management. How can you make better use of, of sheep to decrease the input needs, to adapt your fertilization strategy and your pest management strategies? But in any case, there's a lot to be learned uh, from other countries that have successfully redesigned their vineyard in terms of trellis, width of the system, height of the trellis and irrigation system and semi-permanent fencing to make this integration successful. So based on this survey um, and as a community of researcher and extension specialist, um, we'll be putting together uh, some advising and training on how to manage sheep and vineyards in integrated system. And we are embarking on a complete cost benefit analysis uh, for the environment, but, but also from a more uh, financial um, perspective. And then uh, putting together um, a web page where we will start networking contractor with production with producers providing a platform there for people to meet um, to be um, effective in building those relationships for um, our livestock integration in 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 vineyards and in in our regions. I have a, a very quick question from the yeah. chat. Would it be okay for me to add that right now? Um, Absolutely. Is irrigation damage due to passage or biting? It's mostly passage. Um, if uh, the sheep have, um, you know, water jags, etc., they're not like squalls, <laughs> uh, but they, it's mostly when they hop from one row to the other, uh, which can be mitigated through uh, precise sheep management um, and also relocation of, of the irrigation lines or lower or higher. 
Yeah, it tends to be an issue in which the drip line exists right at the sheep's height and the sheep, as they pass through the vines, ends up disrupting it. So if it's held lower, or it's held higher, it tends to not be an issue. So thanks everyone. Um, that's all what we have for you today. And we wanted to, I mean, there's there's so much more to talk about. Um, and the Napa RCD will, pu will be putting on some, um, some more targeted um, workshop so that we can um, uh, go more into the details of it. But we wanted to move into our question and answer sessions. But before we do that, we wanted to um, take some time for you to talk to each other. Um, and so, uh, um, and, and identify some specific questions that you want to ask us or the audience. Um, so we'll break you up in, in group uh, for uh, five minutes and you can brainstorm and develop one or two questions you have for us or, or the audience. And uh, you'll come back to the main room after five minutes and um, each group will ask one question and, and you can write it in the chat or someone from the group can, can unmute. And if we have time, which I think we, we might, uh, we'll have a second run of questions. And so um, the idea here is, you know, as we've been talking, you have some ideas coming in um, to kind of unpack this in a small group, have a, a little bit of a discussion and then come with a set of questions that we could um, try to answer. So I hope that that will work for um, everybody. Okay, I'm going to send folks to the rooms right now. It's 10.42, so I'll be um, giving you a warning in with a one minute to go, and we'll be back at 10.47. Emily and Kelsey, you may end up in a room, and I apologize. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, taking part in those breakout rooms. I think that was a great way just to channel our questions a little bit more. So now um, we'd love to hear what questions you came up with. We have about 10 minutes to finish off today. Um, so questions can go either in the chat or if you wish to unmute yourselves, we're a fairly small group, so feel free to go ahead and unmute. That would be great as well. Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, can I start with, uh, I think I'll, I'll be, it'll be easier to ask than write it down because I'm not really sure how to uh, uh, ask it. So, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so basically the question was something on, on the lines of uh, which cover crops to use and, and let's look like which cover crops to start with and how do we integrate them in no-till systems at which point and when do we introduce the sheep if we want to graze. Kelsey do you want to take that a little bit? Yeah I'd be happy to. Um, so as far as how you would integrate cover crops into a no-till system I mean the biggest way that people do it is with a no-till drill um, and that can be hard also to find an implement that fits within the vine row for that. You can broadcast and uh, amend over with like compost or manure application. And if there's a good enough rain that could take, um, it dep depends on the quality of your soil on the tree. Um, but from a cover crop composition point of view, um, honestly, this is a point of, of where a lot more research is needed. But what we could tell you based on what we've looked at is that the typical cover crop mixture that goes into vineyards might not be the right one for grazing, right? A typical cover crop mixture might have your, your bell beans or favas, legume or uh, peas, field peas and vetch. And so that is a cover crop composition that we've looked at a lot and we see that um, if you're doing one graze in your year, which is a termination graze, just to terminate the cover crop instead of mow, that might be a fine composition. But oftentimes the way that this is done in the landscape is that there's two grazes over the dormant season, one kind of mid-season graze and one termination graze. And there's a few reasons why that happens, but that's pretty typical. And so if you are gonna do that strategy, then maybe moving towards things like clover in vetch might be more beneficial because they're better, they have a better response to grazing disturbance. Right. So it's about balancing the multiple objectives that you might have for your cover crop. Um, uh, but really be mindful if you're going to graze it, be mindful about it as well into co-creating this mix with the grazer um, and, and um, thinking about how it will regrow and what other services it might provide for pest suppression, for instance. Thank you, Kelsey. See, Any other question? Yeah, I do see we have one in the chat. Um, so Chris was asking, are other animals appropriate, goats or too destructive? And then the second part of that is how to found, find sheep in Mariposa or the Southern Sierra foothills. <laughs> 
So are other animals appropriate? Um, I think sheep are, are a very nice combination for vineyards. Um, just because, as you mentioned, they're less destructive than goats and a little bit easier to manage uh, from a behavioral standpoint. Now, I'm not, I'm not an animal, you know, science person. So this is just what I've heard from grazers and vineyard managers. Um, in terms of finding sheep in, in Mariposa, uh, we could put you in, in, in touch with um, some grazers we know. Um, but I think there's, there's some potential opportunity to think with ranchers around your area as well and providing them some uh, additional forage source. Um, so um, we hope to be creating this platform to put in, in contact grazers and, and, um, and vineyard managers, but that does not exist quite yet. So it's about asking neighbors, asking your extension specialists, asking people at Hopland for instance, who, who, who know um, who has um, the animals. I know um, there is a, sorry to break in, but I know there's a early stages of a project in Sonoma County, um, match.graze, I think it's called, like a right. match.com for grazers. <laughs> So it's at an early stage, but it's taking shape. Um, you can also, we, we've seen some example at Piscinus Ranch, for instance, where there's um, a, a longer grazing, where there's also a succession of animals, um, especially before planting the vineyard. So they will go with large ruminants and then go to small ruminant in a succession. Um, so that's, that's also an opportunity to think about it more broadly in time. Yeah, I would add just a, a few things on that. Uh, the first one is that I think that, um, you know, we've worked a lot with both contract grazers who are um, shepherds at, at heart and also vineyard producers. And this is a really excellent match as that video kind of described. And I think that you would see that if, if you can locate some grazers in your area, that they'd be very happy to have a place to put their animals in a lot of regards. So these relationships do form pretty well, pretty quickly. The second thing that I would say is that there is a network of shepherds and other fiber producers in California called Fiber Shed, and that might be a place to start as far as finding contract grazers in your area. Mm -hmm. But in, in any case, you know, extension specialists and RCS, um, UCNR, um, they're there for you to help you out with creating those linkages. Any questions from other groups that you discussed? John? Yeah. Um, hi, Emily and, and uh, Kelsey. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, for people who are looking to tweak their vineyards to integrate sheep or design vineyards around integrated sheep, where would you recommend that they go to for best resources and best designs? We do not have a set of, of uh, fact sheets quite yet ready for California. Um, my recommendation would be to turn to the internet and look at what's going on in New Zealand, um, where they've been redesigning their vineyard uh, for a long time. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be really a mirror uh, because we need to adapt to our own practices and, and objectives. But I think there's, there's some opportunities here to build on each other and not necessarily reinvent the wheel as this is a pretty big end over to, to redesign a vineyard. So you, you want to build on some previous knowledge that we do not have in California or very little. Um, so it's about looking elsewhere with people with a long tradition of grazing in vineyard. And then some of um, the... the the producers who've done it in the Napa Valley, there's a couple of producers, two, three producers I can think of that have been at it for 10, 20 years um, that can share some insights as to how would they design their vineyards. Yeah, okay. and again, the, the other thing I'd plug is just like Amelie mentioned, the relationship tends to be one in which there's contract grazers who have a kind of generational knowledge and shepherding in California did take a fairly large hit over the last 10, 20 years. And so a lot of the knowledge base of California shepherding was hurt during that time, but it has been rebuilding and there has been more contract raisers who have been starting out. 
and that knowledge base is, um, I mean, they know what they're doing. When you watch some like Chaos or some of these other sheep grazers go out into this vineyard and you watch them go, it's like they're very skilled at what they do and they're very effective. And so that knowledge base does exist. And, and I think that those relationships are just about building between vineyard producers and shepherds. Yeah. Just on that note, I thought it's um, worth recognizing. So we here at Hopland Rec are really keen to support folks who might be making those kinds of transitions um, and share whatever experience we might have in our area or their expertise like we are able to do today. So if anybody would like to write in the chat anything that they feel would be of help to them, any kind of um, training event, um, that would be uh, very useful for us. We are planning our events post COVID <laughs> and we're looking forward to uh, supporting folks and helping out where we can. I see that uh, Terry McCartney was saying that um, she felt that there would be a, a useful training on livestock guardian dogs to support the, uh, the efforts that would be putting sheep in different areas. Any other questions? We have um, three minutes. Anybody like to take that last little bit of time? Anything okay. else in your group discussions? I do see one question here from Pedro. What is the duration of grazing periods in commercial sheep vineyard systems? Is there a target? Target sward heights, grazing everything from the ground, time? Right, thanks Pedro for um, the questions. I'm trying to find, Kelsey, you wanna, I just, I lost yeah. my PowerPoint here. We can talk a little bit about it. I mean, uh, Pedro oh, actually comes from a research unit in Brazil that looks at integrated cattle corn soy systems and so and from an animal science point of view so Pedro knows a lot about the subject but um yeah what I would say is that we haven't had the opportunity really to explore um like a, from a research point of view the optimal kind of like grazing pressure strategy in these systems and it comes way more from the contract grazers in the landscape uh and how they have managed and believe is the correct management for the system which generally involves bringing out somewhere around 200 uh, to 250 sheep uh, for, you know, like a 50 plus acre size vineyard and moving them in acre size um, paddock fences. Um, and it depends on the goal kind of of the grazing. Like I said, there's a mid season graze and then there's a termination graze, but just talking about the termination graze. It's a, it's a high pressure that's usually about 50 sheep per acre for one day to two days. And they have multiple paddocks in which they're moving at the same time. Um, from a sword height point of view, um, the first graze that they go in, I think that they usually try and, uh, we do it in inches here rather than centimeters. And they usually try and leave about a four to six inch sword height. And then the termination graze is uh, basically terminating down to like a one or two inch, like terminating it down to the ground. Well, we're at 10.59 and I don't want to keep people beyond the time that we had asked. So um, I just want to say a huge thank you to um, Kelsey and to um, Emily um, for joining us today. We really appreciate this. This is the very first in our spotlight on research for um, the uh, Hopland Research and Extension Center. In January, we'll, we'll be hosting another one which will be looking at um, wildlife recovery after wildfire. Um, so yeah, do put your hands together in whatever way, your emojis, whatever way you'd like to for Emily and Kelsey. Thank you so much for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, attending and your interest. And this will be recorded and posted on the website. So we'll um, share with everybody who signed up too. Yes. yes Thank yes. you so much then. And. Mm -hmm.